Hey there, good afternoon. Alright, this presentation. Today's presentation is about Google's obsession with, with artificial intelligence and how that will change the way we do internet marketing. Who here remembers uh, Mentalplex, Google's April Fool's joke in 2000, the first ever April Fool's joke? Who here wasn't even in high school yet in April of 2000? <laughs> Alright, uh, Mentalplex, Google's first April Fool's joke. You, um, you just stared into the revolving spiral and projected your mental image of what you're looking for. And then you visualized clicking on the thing. And if you, if you weren't quite up to visualizing the click, you could actually just click on it. And it would, uh, and it would give you an error message. Either uh, insuffic insufficient conviction, please clap hands three times while chanting, I believe, and try again. Um, you know, various other messages, like you know, your thoughts are too vague. Please uh, try to think more clearly, or you know, this is a family website. We can't deliver your results. Um, so they had different, different funny error messages. Uh, anybody into geek humor should really check out Google uh, Mentalplex FAQ. Uh, so great humor there. So that, that's always, and that was a joke back then, but it's becoming more and more true and kind of scary. This is Google Glass. This is no longer science fiction. This is um, will be released in a developer version within the next few months. It should release to the public in roughly a year. And the idea is sort of combines a smartphone with your glasses, puts everything together, a super smartphone. And so you walk into the subway, and it tells you the subway service is suspended, and it asks you if you want to walk or take public transportation. And so you decide to walk, it gives you the, uh, the walking directions. Then you're in the store, it tells you how to get to the music section. Apparently, in Google's futuristic vision of the world, the only thing not digitized are books. It's, uh, it's great for stalking, it tells you your friend is 400 feet away. And then a few hours later, you're uh, playing the ukulele for your girlfriend and uh, showing her the sunset over the river. It's really the perfect date for geeks and for Orthodox Jews because you get all the benefits of, uh, of a date with the uh, cute girl without any ickiness of uh, physical proximity. <laughs> some, uh, some quotes from the, from the Google guys, Larry Page in 2002. Google will fulfill its mission only when its search engine is AI complete. Every time I talk about Google's future with Larry Page, he argues that it will become an artificial intelligence. Google, Google realized that uh, to reach their goal of being best in search, they needed to have the world's top AI research software. That, that, was, that was Google's decision in internal memo. And they basically built it. They have a Google X Lab, which does projects like um, Google Glasses and the Google Driverless Cars, we'll get to in a minute. Uh, don't panic if all these things give you images of a super intelligent system that will turn on its creators. It's good to know that Sergey Brin is hopeful that it won't have the kind of bug that will destroy mankind. Um, strong AI, uh, only a month ago or so, a few weeks ago, they hired uh, Ray Kurzweil, who's one of, if not the most prominent uh, respected figure in the strong AI movement, the movement that really believes that we're going to have uh, human-like intelligence in our neural networks and computers. This particular car is, uh, is, a, is an April Fool's joke, but Google does have the driverless car. Um, it's already out. They set it off on, a, on an obstacle course of over a thousand miles and everything from highway driving to this one lane highway, one, excuse me, one lane road, where its oncoming traffic was coming, had to back into a driveway and pull back out. And they went over 100,000 miles and the only accident was when it got rear-ended at a traffic light. Google launched its, uh, its neural network off on, on YouTube. It found, um, and it discovered catfaces. That is, it wasn't, it was a significant, considered significant because it wasn't told to find catfaces. It was just told to, you know, figure out the world. And it started recognizing this pattern that was a catface. Um, this is from New York Times. Their headline, how many computers are there by cat 16,000? Um, the actual number is 1,000, so the New York Times technology section was off by a factor of 16, which means that it's more accurate than the rest of the newspaper, but possibly less accurate than Google's neural networks. One of the biggest things in my, let's move on, moving on to search, um, perhaps the biggest thing in my opinion about Panda and Penguin is that before Panda and Penguin, Google would frequently say things like, well, we don't use that uh, source of information because it's too noisy or it's too easy to spam. After Panda and Penguin, they stopped saying that. That's Panda and Penguin marked the time where Google took the leap and said, we're going to look at everything. We believe we are now smart enough to look at every data source we can get our hands on and decide and cross-reference it with others and figure it out and decide how relevant everything is, what we can believe, what we can't believe, and move forward with that. It was, it was a, to me, a huge step forward, a huge leap of faith. They were very successful with it, and that's where things are moving from now on. That is, they're moving from now that they're going to look at everything
everything they can figure out, everything they can look at, and draw their own conclusions. Um, so some of the things that are more and more important in search. I'm ready to see user engagement. I'll give one example. Um, Jim mentioned, uh, discussed pogo sticking before. I'll give an example of that. Pogo sticking is where you see a, a user sees a search result in Google, he clicks onto your site, he's not happy, he comes back, he clicks on a different result from the same listings of search. That's a strong signal to Google that you did not satisfy their user. And that will no longer just hurt you on that page, it will hurt your entire site when there are too many of those. So, a quick example, uh, on our, one of our sites, we had written a post on Clinton's uh, speech to the Democratic National Convention. Uh, it was a projection of what he was going to say. And then after the convention, we should have realized it was going to happen, but, it, but we hadn't realized it yet, that we saw we were getting a lot of search traffic for Clinton's DNC speech. And presumably, they were not looking for a projection of what we thought he would say before the speech, but what he actually said. So it's an easy problem to solve, right? So you go in, we, uh, we embedded a YouTube video of a speech, it linked to a transcript, linked to a couple of uh, commentary and a speech as an update to the third post, and then we had the original post below. It was a pretty easy problem to solve, but you gotta be aware of it. In, in the past, before Panda, before Panda, we might have gone about it by saying, well, okay, we don't have what he wants, but that's okay, we're gonna make money, I'm gonna better monetize him, we're gonna see if we can keep him as a loyal user. Now our first concern is how do we make sure he doesn't focus it? How do we make sure he doesn't go back to Google and say, I was unsatisfied with this site? Social knowledge graphs getting more and more important. Um, you can see examples of this on, on the right side of the screen. So the knowledge graph you see already in the Dr. Barry Schwartz, um, in the TED Talks, all these uh, well-known psychologists, and then you see the social graph on top of that, the Barry Schwartz who's in, who's in my circles. And you know, you need to be feeding both graphs. And increasingly feeding both graphs, feeding the social graphs, of course, by interacting on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, Google Plus, etc. Um, feeding the knowledge graph in several different ways. Um, Google acquired Freebase a couple of years ago. Freebase takes knowledge from Wikipedia and various other sources. You could also, so you, sh you can be feeding Freebase through feeding uh, Wikipedia, particularly the info boxes. Uh, you can also feed Freebase directly through their APIs, and can, likely this is going to be an increasing part of our jobs as SEOs. Um, there's also structured data. There was a great session a few hours ago on structured data. It's came in that org, so you know you've got a site with a lot of paintings on it. So you go in, you mark it all up. This is the genre. This is the title. This is the price. This is the image. You mark everything up semantically, so Google knows what's where, and. The sites that are doing this are likely in the future to be getting more traffic than the sites that say, well, Google's smart enough, it should figure out by itself. Help Google out, getting yourself out there. Some of the ways Google works this magic is something called the document classifier, that is, everything comes in, they say, well, this is more like a government site, Wikipedia, the New York Times, or is it more like a scraper of thin content? So whenever you have a question of, should I do this feature or not, say, does this make me look like a good site or a bad site? For example, what's in a name? Does anybody know how the New York Times refers to this woman? Secretary of State? Hillary Rodham Clinton. Excellent. Google noticed, Google News team noticed this all the way back in 2002, that the better sites usually refer to her as Hillary Rodham Clinton. So correlation is causation with document classifiers. That is, what good sites do is what good sites do. That is, anything that good sites are doing and that you do will make you look more like the site. It doesn't matter if the action itself is, is positive, negative, or, or ambiguous, or neutral. If the good sites are doing it, you want to be doing it. If the bad sites are doing it, you don't want to be doing it. So don't just look at a fact and say, well, why should Google care? If the bad sites are doing it, Google doesn't have to care. It's all unstructured learning. It's all like finding cats. They're finding the patterns that indicate good sites and bad sites, so you want to be more like the good sites. Footprint of a scraper. When uh, Panda came around, I was at Answers.com, we expected uh, Wiki Answers, one of our subdomains that had a, lot, that had a lot of thin content to get crashed. It didn't in the original Panda. Instead, our reference site, where we spent tons of money licensing great content, that got crushed. And the reason why is it had the footprint of a scraper. It looked like a content scraper. Even though we were spending millions, we were spending a lot of money getting great content, we looked like a content scraper, we got crushed. So try to look like a good site. Okay, like if you have some UGC content, um, fix the spelling, capitalization, punctuation, if you can. I get rid of emoticons. Beware of scalable solutions. Anything that can scale is probably been burned by SEOs. Any tactic that scales has probably been burned by SEOs. So for example, buying 10,000 links is bad. Um, buying four or five links may be great. Getting 10,000 block, block comments is bad. Getting a few in the right place in the right way may be great. Okay. SEOs, you know, that every, every few years, for the last 15 years, people keep announcing SEOs are pending debt. Um, 
Leo Laporte, another West intelligent man, talked about it uh, a year and a half ago. I was going to die. He was talking about because killed by Siri. Things he missed are even if the front end is voice oriented, the back end is still search uh, slash artificial intelligence. Uh, my money would be on Google, not Apple, in an artificial intelligence war. And SEO's influence are likely to grow because SEO isn't just about you know the specific tactic, doorway pages, keyword stuffing, whatever. Those tactics may die. But SEO is about finding out what works today and tomorrow that will get you more traffic from Google. In conclusion, the driver that AI be like a good site, the number one tactic is to try to actually be a good site. But beyond that, do the things that good sites are doing. SEO is going to be moving from keyword focus to the entity knowledge, social author graphs. In his phones, Google is an artificial intelligence company, search for Stefan Spath, and Google and good SEOs are the undead. If you missed anything, uh, it'll be up on SlideShare, it's on our blog at Magic Greatness, and uh, thank you.